That part wasn't working so well for me over here. So. Wow, I have like never talked to so many people in the Middle East at once before. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, uh, <laughs> <Keep going. laughs> okay. Oh, uh, great. <laughs> um, so hi, I'm Jacob Applebaum, and uh, I'm from the Tor Project, and uh, I do some independent computer security research. I um, I started a group in San Francisco with some friends called Noisebridge, which is a sort of like hack lab, uh, and we do all sorts of stuff relating to free software. We care about like civil liberties, uh, but mostly Noisebridge is a community. My work with Tor is with advocacy and development of software. I look for at um, firewalls and filtering in different countries, for example. Um, and uh, I'm here today to talk to you about Tor, like sort of the big picture of what Tor is about. But I was also told that people here are really interested in, in knowing about a whole range of stuff. And I tried to put together, like I thought, like how could I put together a talk that covers like 15 subjects all at once? So what I decided is that I wouldn't. And instead you can just ask me, because that way I can give you a really good answer if, if you have a question. Um, because it's uh, it's not possible to cover like the cold boot attack, the rogue MD5 certificate stuff, noise bridge and tour in like you know 40 minutes or something, as much as I would like to. Um, so I was wondering if you guys actually had any questions to start with, other than maybe anybody, possibly. Like, is there anything like you really wanted me to start off with, or should I just talk about tour? Just, just talk about tour. <laughs> Okay, great. That's, that works out perfectly. Thanks. That makes it really easy. Um, so um, my work in the Torah project right now uh, for the last month has been traveling around the Middle East, which has been really exciting. Uh, learning some Arabic has been really uh, enlightening. And uh, meeting Arabs from all over um, the Gulf, the Middle East, and Africa has been just fantastic. The Arab people that I've met have really treated me very well and been very hospitable. And that it, it especially extends to the people that brought me here today. So thank you for having me. Um, now, Tor itself is a free software project, and it's released under the BSD license, and uh, we believe that it's very important to have this be free software because the tool itself uh, is a privacy by design uh, system. So what that means is that we have distributed trust in the network itself, and uh, we wanted to make sure that when you use the software that you know what the software does, what we claim the software does, you can verify it. And uh, if you want, you can be an important part of the network simply by downloading the software, compiling it, and running it. So um, we have a full specification, which is in the style of an RFC. I guess all of you here, if you're in the computer science department, you've probably read an RFC or two. So we have an RFC-like uh, specification, which is pretty useful because it means that we make some claims, and we back them up, and we back them up with source code. So. Um, at the moment, there are about 1,500 active Tor servers in the world that route traffic for anyone that wants to use the network. Um, sometimes it goes up to about 2,000, but at any given point in time, there's about 1,500 that are in existence and actually routing traffic. And since it's an anonymity network, it's a little bit difficult to know how many users we have because we don't ask them for logins and passwords. So it's, it's something like we think about a quarter of a million to half a million people use Tor on a regular basis. And um, in my travels in the Middle East, I've met lots and lots, like hundreds of people who have used Tor or who use Tor on a regular basis. And so it seems like even in places like Saudi, people are using Tor, which is to me very exciting. Part of the reason that I work on Tor is because places like Saudi, places like the United States, places with governments that are kind of questionable, with corporations that have questionable interests, those are places where you would want to use Tor. And so I'm very happy to hear that that is in fact happening in the Middle East, even though we have, before my trip here, not had anyone from the Tor project come to the Middle East. So I'm actually the first person from Tor to come here. And uh, you know, I'm happy to report back to my overlords that things are great here and that I want to come back. So um, we are also a nonprofit. And we believe that it's important to be a nonprofit in the particular uh, field that we're in. Because if you're trying to make a profit off of people who have a desire for free speech or anonymity, um, your profit motives will often be at odds with your goal of free speech or anonymity. And so it's additionally nice because it means we can write research grants, 
um, we can take donations and people will get like tax deductions in the United States and um, that's something we think is important as well. And we're probably the only free software project and maybe the only project in the whole world um, that was funded by both the US Department of Defense and the Electronic Frontier Foundation. You like, can't have like a group that is more separate from any other group than the extreme like left-wing civil libertarians and the people that call themselves the Department of Defense. Because, I mean, they don't do any defense, it's all offense. So they're like this, group, right? So it's like, you know, if you're gonna have two groups, that's kind of funny. I mean, there's some other groups that fund this as well. And our basic strategy is that since we're completely transparent, we're transparent about our funding, we're transparent about our protocol, about our source code, and we try to get people from the community that aren't us to run servers, we think it doesn't matter who gives us money. Because ultimately what happens is that it goes into the development of software and the development of the network. And so, you know, we'll take money from, you know, pretty much anybody. So feel free to like line up and, you know, <laughs> just kidding. Um, so I want to give you an idea about uh, anonymity networks here. Depending on where you are, you're going to have a threat model. And your threat model, at least with regards to an anonymity network, looks something like this. The, the traditional problem is that Alice and Bob, I don't know, in computer science in the Arab world, do you have a, do you have like a substitute for Alice and Bob though? Yeah. What, like, what, what is it? It's just Alice and Bob. Well, it's Alice and Bob everywhere, I guess. But I was hoping that in the Arab world it would be like, uh, you know, I don't know, someone else. It would be great. Like, I would love it, but, you know, to, when I give this talk in America next, I could say in the Arab world, it's not Alice and Bob, it's Abdullah and, you know, Agda and, you know, or something like that. But, you know, no such luck. Um, anyway, in general with an anonymity network, you want to find out what someone is doing. You want to find out, um, like, if you're attacking it, you want to find out what someone is doing. You want to find out um, where they're going. You want to influence it. You want to control this in some way, because you want to de-anonymize them. You want to see what they're doing, you want to see the messages that they're sending, and you want to be able to, to de-anonymize them, essentially. Almost always an attacker wants to do that. And the reason is because an anonymity network will have a couple components. It has integrity, it has authenticity, it has um, a secrecy component, which usually is used for circumvention. Because, for example, a request for a web page is encrypted, that means that a filter cannot easily um, see that you're trying to go to a particular website and then block it. I don't know, are there any people here that work on the censorship systems in the Middle East that help filter the internet, maybe? I had a chance to meet some of them recently. I went to meet Al Jazeera in Qatar, and uh, I met a guy who works, uh, who works in Qatar, and he's a really nice guy, um, and he introduced me to his friend from a nearby country that will remain unnamed, and he explained that he worked directly next to the censors, and he said, you know, I build the networks, they break them. And, um, and when I was in Egypt, I also met some people that worked on those networks. And it was really interesting to see the level of technical sophistication. So what they're really focusing on is this watching Alice part. So they watch Alice really carefully. In fact, they, they, for some people in Egypt, for example, they actually monitor the entire internet connection for someone that they suspect to be like a traitor, or to be bad in some way, or to be a threat. And um, so an anonymity network will actually protect you against this. So if they're watching you, they don't actually see what you're doing. So this is a really important component, and watching is one of the first steps um, that people will take to try to attack it. And Tor prevents this, right? And uh, it does this with a whole bunch of really nice tricks, but they're all pretty good and solid from an academic perspective. So it's not really fair to call them tricks. Um, and then, for example, a country could mount an attack by trying to become the network itself. And so far, we haven't seen this. Um, the network is primarily made up of about say 1,500 people that really care about free speech, access uh, to information, and anonymity. During the Iranian uprising that took place this summer, there were hundreds and hundreds of Americans that were like really excited about helping the Iranians. And I thought it was quite funny because they, they were portrayed as anti-government activists. But it was strange because they weren't really like against all governments. They were just against like some particular set of people in one government. But the Americans were just really excited about this, and they set up tons of Tor servers in response. And um, that was, I mean, that was quite, that was quite something to see this. And so, in a way, well, it's possible that someone could put a bunch of Tor servers in there to try to control the network. It's often counterbalanced by people who really feel solidarity, right? So there's real, the concept of mutual aid is really, I think, imbued. It's, 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 it's a part of this. So it could be an attack, but so far we haven't seen that happen in any way that we know of. And then finally. 
um, you could maybe watch 